start with Indian food about a decade or two decades ago. People thought that it's all about curries and North Indian food as such. Now people have started accepting it as a normal home cooked food. We have got great Indian restaurants around the world and people are recognizing it. We have international chefs who are embracing Indian spices and recipes in their menu. So now it's only about chicken tikka and butter chicken, but much more. I'm really proud to introduce Chef Ajay Joshi, who is my classmate from 1983 batch of IHM Channel. Chef Ajoy started his career at the prestigious Taj Group of Hotels in 1980. He enjoys watching cricket, loves exploring wine worlds, traveling, a learning opportunity, a passionate about home cooking, and an eternal connection with Indian food. Chef Ajoy started cooking in 1979 in a city called Hyderabad in South Central India when he was young. Since then, he has been extremely fortunate to have worked with some true masters or ustas in his language, as we call them in India too, who were kind enough to share their knowledge about a cuisine. After finishing his training and have worked at the Taj group of hotels for a long time, Chef decided it was time to take his experiences and move to the land of opportunities, Australia. Chef started his spice journey in Australia with Malabar in crow's nest, Serving so food from the Malabar coast, Malabar was a great success as it brought back memories of a cuisine that was almost unheard of in this part of the world. Chef introduced dosas, biryani, and other South Indian specialities to Sydney dinner to the Danas. In 1998, Chef opened Nilgiri's in Crow's Nest. He wanted to showcase regional Indian cuisines with a difference with an open kitchen, a new menu every month, and cooking classes. Oh, he, he was too busy. After SMH Award for the Best Indian Restaurant, Chef moved to a larger venue in St. Renan's, which was meant to be a destination restaurant with private rooms named after the Vedic elements, Jal, water, Agni, fire, Bhumi, earth, Vayu, wind, and Akash, sky, a cooking studio and a different room. Meanwhile, Chef also started a small and intimate restaurant called Pelisheri in Neutral Bay, serving coastal and southern Indian food. Now, Nilgiri's has turned 18 years this year, and for Chef new venture in Cremon, and he feels it's the right time to do something different to suit to the new premises and the kitchen and to interpret Indian food. For almost 37 years, Chef Ajay Joshi has been sharing his love for Indian cuisine through his unique style of passion and exuberance. I now call upon Chef Ajay Joshi to enlighten us on Indian culinary world, back to the roots. Over to Chef Ajay Joshi. All right, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, first of all, let me wish all of you a very good day. Hopefully all your families and friends are doing well, wherever they are in these yeah, trying and testing yeah. times. So, uh, sorry, uh, um, sorry about the delay post, but it's just that we had some technical issues here all sorted, so hopefully we can move on. Um, and as I said, uh, hope your families and friends and all your relatives are in good health and spirits in these trying and testing times that we are facing all over the world. Um, but uh, thank you for coming and thank you for having me on, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I need to start somewhere. And uh, I thought I should divide this session into three parts. The past, the present, and the future. The past is what they call hindsight in, uh, in terms of uh, a positive psychology. And the present is what they say, insight. The future is what they call foresight. The the past, which is the hindsight, actually teaches us a lot. It prepares us for the present, which is the inside. And then the foresight takes, apparently takes care of itself, which, which uh, I guess should happen if the first two are taken care of. In my case, uh, I also have something called uh, uh, trigger mo moments or trigger movements uh, that have helped me shape my career. 
these trigger moments are a part of these past, present, and future. And I'll, I'll briefly touch upon them as far as possible. Keep things very simple. Uh, try and make it more of a personal journey than a lecture. So, folks, it all began in 1988 uh, when I was made the sous chef of uh, the Taj Residency in Bangalore, and I was given charge of the banquet kitchen an area which is very dear to me because unlike other food and beverage outlets in a banquet you can be a lot of be a lot more creative you can do things that are beyond the boundaries of the restaurant where you have to have very structured menu you can't uh, move to your uh, left or right it has to be within that framework so banquet in a banquet in a lot of ways was my area and i was extremely happy to be a part of that, I was also given free charge of making menus, which was really the beginning of the making of me. Because besides actually uh, working with the food and beverage department, I also had the opportunity to work with a lot of local producers, local people who were involved in the food industry in Bangalore. So, folks, yeah, th this is this is 1987, 88, and Taj is going great. Uh, the banquet department's doing extremely well. The, uh, there's a lot of functions. I get a chance to do what I have to do, what I want to do, what I feel comfortable with. But just as I was settling down, I get a call from uh, the land of the opportunities, or as they, they call the land down under. A group of four businessmen, one each from Fiji, South Africa. Uh, there was a New Zealander and Apparently there was a Chinese man. All these four businessmen joined together and uh, decided that it was the best time for Australia to have a chain of Indian restaurants that would showcase ethnic Indian food. Again, not sure why, but they, they selected me and I was extremely happy because again, instead of doing the run of the mill regular Indian, Indian restaurants, they decided it would be appropriate to do ethnic Indian restaurants, which was again right up my alley. So I packed my bags and I moved to Brisbane, 1988. And 1988 was also the year when Australia was celebrating its bicentenary. There's a lot happening. So right in the middle of the celebrations, we ended up uh, in Brisbane. And the plan was to start about eight to 10 restaurants in a matter of about six months in and around Brisbane and then eventually move around Australia. So around mid-June, uh, we started the first restaurant on the outskirts of Brisbane. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me, folks? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes you're audible. Well. We can hear you. We can hear you, sir. Sorry, yeah. Um, Yes, yes, you are very ordinary, very much. Jeff, you have muted yourself. Mr. Joseph, can you unmute yourself, please? Yes, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, now? sir. Now it's yes, audible. Sir. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure what's yes, happening, sir. but anyway, sorry. I I need to keep my hands off the the mouse. Uh, so, folks. Yeah. Anyway, uh, back to where it was. Uh, uh, where was I? Uh, June 1988, and uh, the first restaurant started after a lot of theatre pomp and show. We were asked to move on and and take over the business. The idea was to do a theme or a or a, a cuisine in one area of each one of the four or five restaurants that we started. So the first one was in this uh, suburb outside of Brisbane. The idea was to do Hyderabadi style food. The second one would have been Rajasthani. The third one probably Kerala and then Chetinar and so on and so forth. The first three weeks, very hectic as always, what we call the honeymoon period went extremely well. Things were looking up. We started the second restaurant in the city. The third outside of uh, the city, and the fourth on the river banks, uh, on, the, on the banks of the river uh, boardwalk. 
So around the month of August, July, August, when things were going great in, in the first restaurant, uh, the second and the third restaurants took off. But as the second and the third restaurants took off, the first one where I was involved right from the beginning started to decline. And over the next four or five weeks, it declined to the point where the numbers had completely dwindled. I'm doing a full house of about 200 covers. We were down to single digit numbers for lunch and around 20 or so numbers for dinner, which is really not sustainable in a business. Um, as a head chef or as the executive chef, the first questions are always, are the fingers pointed towards you and the questions were, what exactly is happening to Joy? And to be honest, I had no answers. Just to take a little pause here, where we started a restaurant across the road, there was another Indian restaurant who had been existing probably for about 10, 15 years before we came in. And that guy was doing booming business. When we started going down, he was still going up. So the question for the people who put the money in was, Ajoy, you need to get your act right. Looks like there's something that is not working. Now, as, as I was concerned, I was the, me and the whole team were putting in 110%. So the question was, where exactly were we going wrong? It went on for a couple of weeks, and then weeks became a few months, and then business was slowly coming down to a point where it almost reached a stage where we had to close shop. Now, as executive chef or as the head of the team, I it, it kind of reached a point where I had to take the responsibility and not trying to do this and cut my losses and run away, but I was kind of unsure whether I should continue in this position. So I decided to quit the job and go back to India. So in about six and six and a half, seven months, I went back to Bangalore. And luckily for me, Taj offered me my job. In fact, they made me executive chef for the new project that was coming up on Gateway, uh, Gateway Road in Bangalore and uh, it was called the Gateway Hotel. I was made the head there, and we started a new project from concept to uh, the actual realization of it, and the project was called Karavli. Now, mind you, Karavli took about eight to nine months. My, I put in my heart and soul, but mind you, I there was one element of me which was still connected to, to Australia. And mind you, I actually went to Australia not only to be a part of this chain, but also to fulfill a dream of mine, which was to start my own little restaurant. And of course, there was this added uh, benefit of watching cricket, uh, whether it was Brisbane or Melbourne, uh, it, it, it was definitely one of the dreams. But anyway, back to Karavli, we started Karavli. And during that time, I actually met Mira, my wife now, and we got married. Just before marriage, Mira sat down with me and said, Joy, what exactly is your vision or is your plan in life? What exactly are you planning to do? Or what would you like to do? And I said to Mira, I said, Mira, my, though my heart is here in, in, in Bangalore, my mind is still in Brisbane. I'm partly here and partly there. And I, I do feel that I have unfinished business that I need to complete back in Brisbane. She said, Ajoy, if that's the case, what is holding you back? Now, as I said, there were some trigger moments in my life, and this was probably the first trigger moment in my life that actually made me think, why am I still in Bangalore if my mind says I need to be in Brisbane? So two days after my wedding, I packed my bags and we were off to Bombay, en route to Melbourne this time. And just before I took the flight, it was an early morning flight, I remember Mira came to me and said, Ajoy, I really want you to do a small favor to yourself and to us, if you could please write on a small piece of paper your vision for yourself and what are your dreams in, in Australia, in life, for personal, professional, whatever it is. So I wrote, wrote down on a piece of paper what I thought I really wanted to do in life, in, in my professional life. I wrote it, folded the paper, gave it back to Mira. She said, no, that's fine, Ajoy, just leave it there. Hopefully it comes handy someday. I take the flight, I come to, Brisbane, to Melbourne this time, work for this beautiful restaurant. But mind you again, this restaurant had the same problems that I had faced in Brisbane before. Uh, it all started off well, then things started to go down south. But this time I was hell bent not to quit and go back to India, but I decided to move from Melbourne to Sydney. 
and the hope that at some point Mira would join me because she was still in Bangalore. So I moved to Sydney around 1990. And then in 1990, I started Malabar. Mira came and joined me. Things were again looking good. It reached a point where it was status quo. Life wasn't taking any dramatic turns, uh, though I would really have wished to change by many every three months, which has always been the philosophy at Nailgiri is now, the constant change of menus. But my expert was of the belief that if it ain't broke, why fix it? If the menu is going great, why do we have to change? Uh, over a period of time, we had differences. I quit. And Mira and I decided that instead of again going back into a shell and retreating, let's take some time off and travel. So we took a year off. So travel around to see different parts of the world where wherever there was food, we thought we should go. But it was not just food, it was Indian food that was really calling me. And uh, Mira and I thought, why not go to places where there is Indian a concentration of Indians who are either migrants or who have been there for a long time, whether on work or uh, taken up residence. So the places we thought we could visit were uh, definitely South Africa, which has uh, in Dermot, which has one of the largest populations of uh, Indians. Um, then, it, of course, it was Malaysia, where in a place called Penang, we have a lot of uh, Sikhs. Uh, then we decided England is definitely on the on the charts in uh, on the agenda. We should pay a visit to London. So all these places put together, we then thought maybe uh, a visit to Switzerland and Paris would also be a part of the culinary journey. So we finish uh, our first trip, which is uh, Malaysia. And mind you, Penang has fantastic Indian food, something that I had never seen or heard before. Uh, and there were two kinds of Indian cuisines. One that was still connected to the motherland. So there was Indian food, which has connections or which had connections to India. And then there was Indian food, which had, which had uh, evolved in Malaysia. The, the cuisine that had evolved in Malaysia was called curries. The food that had still connect, had connections to the motherland had ethnic names. Very interesting. We stayed there for a couple of weeks, then we moved to London. And then from London, of course, uh, Switzerland. Now, in Switzerland, we took this train from Little Matterhorn to uh, probably go to the border. And then the idea was to uh, not jump over, but cut across to, to, to France because it's just uh, the, the station has got two parts. One is uh, Switzerland, the other is France. Literally, they are one station, but two sides of the, the, the country or different countries. So in this train, a uh, very interesting episode happened. And I, I would call this a second trigger moment. We were in a compartment where there were three seats on either side facing each other. Uh, two on the window side and there was an aisle and then there were two windows. Fortunately or unfortunately for us, we got seats in the middle facing each other. So both of us are looking at each other. To my left, there's a gentleman sitting uh, and to meet us right, there's another lady sitting. And so is the case that another couple sitting next to each other. And uh, Mira and I both very keen in photography then, and Mira still is, though I've given up my video recordings. I don't have time anymore. Uh, Mira was very keen on taking still photography with her cameras and lenses and the entire paraphernalia. I had my video camera on, hoping to get some pictures of the landscape. Unfortunately, we were in the middle. But it so happened that as the train moved, the two gentlemen, uh, the two people sitting to my right and Mira's left, decided to take a walk to the to the pub or the bar in the in the train which really gave us a view of the other side of uh, of the of the journey which was looking down the valley beautiful sight and we thought we should take a seat there and take photographs but as we sat in that chair looking at each other uh, these two people who had vacated the the seats came back and were very very i wouldn't say upset but they were unhappy that we had occupied their seats. This went on for a while. And mind you, this is a three and a half hour journey. We were very keen to take photographs. These people were not keen to give us a seat. So we decided it's time to just shut shop and just stay quiet. After about 45 minutes or so, the gentleman to my left, left hand side, who was, who was occupying the window seat, and the lady was sitting to the right of Mira, who was also occupying the window seat, offered to give us their 
see, it's very kind of them. Um, after a bit of hesitation, we took up the seats and we started taking photographies. And one thing led to the other, and there was a slight conversation. And the slight conversation became a little more conversation. And as time passed, we offered each other a drink, and we had a, a glass of beer and a glass of wine, whatever. The conversation turned to what my profession was and what we were doing in Switzerland. And that's when I told the gentleman that I was a chef by profession and uh, we lived in Australia, which was our new home. And we were on a so-called culinary journey. We were trying to understand food trends around the world for about a year or so. As I finished speaking, the gentleman said to me, he said, uh, you'd be surprised, Joy, but I used to be in Mumbai in the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, he gave me his card and he said, take a look at the card at some point. It might be of interest to you. And he said, I was employed, uh, uh, not employed, I, I worked for the uh, one of the top hotels in, 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 in Mumbai. And uh, when I looked at his card, uh, he was the uh, president of the Sheraton group of hotels. And this was an absolute surprise because Sheraton and Oberoi's were in, in uh, collaboration then. And he said, yes, I was at the Oberoi's um, for about three years as the head of operations area. And he said, I love Indian food. And I, I, I cannot tell you more, Joe, but the amount of Indian food that I've eaten traveling India uh, is, is, has really you know, improved my my skills on, uh, on on understanding spices and and the culture of India and the history of India because food history culture they all go together and he said the one thing I always kept telling my my staff and my general manager and my food and beverage people was that it's about time we at the Oberoi Hotel should do an ethnic Indian restaurant a restaurant that featured food from different parts of India, not just the typical butter chicken, palak paneer, chicken tikka masala, so on and so forth, which is what they were doing with a lot of finesse. And, and that's a style that Oberoi uh, you know, takes by them. He said, well, yeah, but to my utter disappointment, it never happened. And that's one thing I hold back against the, the, the big hotels of India, at least then. And I wish that you as a chef, an Indian chef, could at some point in your life look at Indian food and say, or ask yourself, why is it that French food is called cuisine, Chinese food is called cuisine, Japanese food is called cuisine, but when it comes to Indian food, it's, got, it's not got the status of a cuisine, we just say Indian food. Have you ever asked yourself, why is it that none of the chefs can ever recreate ethnic Indian food in a restaurant atmosphere? Now, this to me was my second trigger moment in life. Mira and I looked at each other and said, wow, we've got what we need. We've got the matter and we've got the material. We have now got the energy and this man has given me that impetus. He's given me that push. It's, I think we should go back and start a restaurant. However, we decided to uh, spend some time in Paris and then America and so on and Morning. so forth. Six months later, we were in Sydney. And- uh, Sandeep, so introduce yourself. I'm sorry. Did I interrupt someone? Can you hear me? Sorry, Usha. Is is am I still? Hello? Oh, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I sorry. I I thought there was someone talking. So anyway, yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. So six months uh, later, we were in in Sydney and all ready to start this new venture. But uh, you know they uh, we had other plans uh, which well other things that were planned but sometimes you plan them they don't happen sometimes you don't plan them and they happen and it was that just as we returned back to Sydney Mira was pregnant with our son so we looked uh, at each at each other and said is it a good time now to start a new business because we have a new member joining us in the family which really means that we are going to probably be running two businesses simultaneously. Running a family, a young family, and running a business are pretty similar, uh, which I'm sure some of you do know or understand. But having spoken to Mira, she said, Joy, this is how it's going to be. You will look after the restaurant, you look after that part of the 
business and I look after the other part of the business, which is to raise our little baby. So we split our responsibilities and we started this restaurant and we called it Nilgiris. The idea was to showcase Indian food the way it was or the way it is or it was uh, then without compromises, but with a little bit of uh, ourselves into the cuisine, because at the end of the day, it was me cooking the, the food. And if I didn't put myself into it, I wouldn't be doing it. However, both of us decided we would do a menu that changes, if not every month, at least once every three months. And the idea was again, not to stop with one region, but continue around the country. So we started off, our first menu was Hai to Dari. And uh, we had dishes that had probably been unheard of in, in most parts of uh, Australia, and, and I'm pretty sure even in certain parts of India. Uh, dishes like Patthar Ka Gosh, uh, Kachi Gosh Ki Biryani, Haleem, so on and so forth. We also had Bakar Khani. We had beautiful dishes on the menu. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, it was a beautiful dream, but to run a business, you don't just need a dream. You need people to sit. You need bumps on seats. You need you need cash flow. Uh, a one uh, a month and a half went by. Uh, we were in our Maharaj second menu, and uh, the second menu was from a region called Maharashtra, specifically a place called Marathwada. The first month was uh, not a very success, big success, but it, it I would say it was strong, uh, good enough for me to continue. So we started with the second menu, which was, uh, as I said, Marathwada food, uh, dishes uh, like bhakri and kandya and zhunka uh, and uh, thesa and, uh, you know, uh, Marathwada mutton, which is really spicy, very similar to the Rajasthani style of cooking lamb and mutton. So we had that menu going. Uh, about two weeks into the menu and I hired this first visitor, a gentleman who looked very Indian. And it so happened to be that uh, I came to know later that he was the first Indian to have arrived into Australia. He came pre-partition, 1946, he was in Australia, even before Pakistan and Bangladesh were formed. And he had settled in, in Australia in a place uh, very close to my restaurant. But this gentleman came over to the restaurant looking for the typical run-of-the-mill butter chicken, chicken tikka masala, and to his absolute utter surprise and then I won't say disappointment because he went out very happy. He was, he had this meal and he said to me at the end of the meal, he said, uh, first of all, young man, I'm not sure who you are, but whatever you, wherever you have done your training, you've done a fantastic job because this takes me back to my place where I come from. And I'm from Maharashtra, he said. And he said, I really would wish you, and I wish you all the luck and I would wish that you continue to do this uh, uh, this part of the uh, uh, the art that you're doing, continue with it because this is fantastic. And this is what Australia needs. This is what Sydney needs. So let me, quite encouraged, Mira and I, though Mira is not there, I told her about this and uh, the entire team was very elated, but extremely happy. And over the next 15, 20 years, the gentleman, Mr. Nana Apte, as we called him, became one of my regular customers. To me, this was the second trigger moment uh, or rather the third trigger moment. Uh, this gave me encouragement. As we continued with Nilgiri's, I met uh, about a period of six months later, I met a lady who was with the uh, media and she said to me, Joy, uh, have you ever thought of doing a book, a cookbook? And I said, wow, well, that never struck me, but I'm happy to do a book. She said, Joy, this is how it will be. I know you are a busy person, you don't have time, but..." I will start taking down recipes from you. You just have to narrate them, I'll take them down. So folks, here I am cooking in the kitchen, busy day and talking to this lady who's sitting on the counter taking down notes. And in the next six to nine months, we get a draft ready for about 110, 120 recipes. And over the next six months, we do our, our uh, trial runs and then the book comes out in uh, early 1999, probably 2000. Uh, so this is the moment which every chef is living for to start a restaurant, which is followed by a cookbook. The cookbook comes out, it's an amazing book. It, it, it was one of the biggest hits because Australia had not seen anything like that. There were plenty of cookbooks written by 
uh, people of Indian origin, but never a cookbook written by a professional chef. The book, uh, as I said, was a big hit. There was a lot of media interest. People from all uh, parts of Australia wanted to buy the book, and it became a big thing. Life goes on. We were nominated, and we won the award for the best Indian restaurant. In 2002, I get this call from a Japanese lady saying, Joy, I have a beautiful space over here, over two levels that can seat about 300 odd people. Now, mind you, I'm running a 60, 60 odd seater restaurant, and from 60 to 300 is a, is a pretty big jump. She said, take a look at it, see the premises and see if you, if, if you think it is of any interest to you, I can help you because I know a lady who's, a, who's an architect, she can help you do the design. And it's not very expensive because the owner who is a Japanese is planning to retire and he wants to hand over the restaurant to someone who can look after it. So Mira and I take a look at this restaurant and the first look tells us this is it. We need to be here. So both of us get the Japanese lady who's uh, also the architect and uh, get the design done. She brings out this beautiful restaurant for us. It takes about six months. And the restaurant's got these five beautiful rooms, Jal, Agni, Bhumi, Vayu, and Akash. It had a fantastic um, uh, kitchen on the first floor. It had a prep kitchen on the ground floor. It had everything that I was looking for in a restaurant. And at the entrance was a beautiful uh, glass area, open, open area, which could be turned into a different room. So Mira and I decide this is where we will take our restaurant to. This is going to be the next level. So 2002, we entered this new premises, uh, extremely happy. And uh, from a 60-seater restaurant to a 300-seater restaurant, excitement, nervousness, it's all apprehension, fear. But then I said to Mira, you know, Mira, if you don't take this risk, uh, it's probably going to be risky losing everything. It's probably never going to happen. So she said, enjoy. Once you decide to take the risk, once you decide to jump in, you jump in, I jump with you. So the two of us get in. And over the next uh, three to six months, we build this place up. Uh, beautiful menus, we decide to have a, uh, each one of those private rooms to have its own menu. So if you were to get into a room called Jal, which, had, which would seat about 14 people, you had a choice of your own menu. You could say, um, I wanted menu from uh, 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 Bengal, or you say, I wanted a menu from Andhra, and uh, you said, I wanted a menu from Kashmir. We, we were more than happy to create that for you, as long as it had, it gave us enough time. And the time frame was about 48 hours to uh, three days. I had a fantastic team. Uh, from a team of about five chefs, we had now moved to about 18 chefs. So massive team. And the front from about 10 in the front, we now had about about 25 plus 20, about 45 people in the front uh, on two levels. So massive operation and a lot of excitement, a lot of energy. So we start off with this and as time passes, Neil Giddies takes off, uh, media interest again, big with, uh, big with what we're doing. We are in pretty much heavy, you know, lifestyle newspaper, magazine, awards, rewards, accolades are part of the journey. But, you know, at the back of my mind, I always knew that, uh, life and uh, especially in this industry it's 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 a yo-yo what goes up must come down and it goes up again so uh, not to try and rest on the laurels of these awards and rewards but take every day as it comes uh, and, and work with the philosophy that you're only as good as the last meal that you've served because that really keeps you well grounded with this little philosophy we kept working and Neil Giddy's boomed Neil Giddy's ballooned it grew and then one fine day I meet this man uh, he's an Englishman. This was my third trigger moment. I meet this man uh, and he said to me, Joy, uh, I've got a beautiful restaurant in a place called Nusa. And uh, I know you've been doing cooking classes, but your classes have been more of a demonstration classes where people sit down and listen to you and watch you cook. How about you do a cooking class with people actually cooking with you, a hands-on class? So this became my next trigger moment where I went with David Horton to Nusa and I cooked in his cooking studio where every chef or every participant had his own burner, his own range, his own cooking equipment. And uh, either they worked uh, together as a pair or uh, you could work individually. And that really made me think that, you know, uh, nothing like putting your hands into this uh, 
uh, these spice mixes and doing it yourself. So from uh, Nusa, we came back after a couple of days there and Nira and I decided that our demonstration classes now need to turn into full hands-on classes. So 2003 onwards, every class that we did was a hands-on class. We invested in burners and electric burners and so on and so forth. And uh, from a class where I would demonstrate uh, to about 10 to 12 people, we now had uh, between 18 and 22 people. They either worked in pairs or if they were happy to work individually, more than happy to do it for them as well. So the classes started from demonstration to hands-on and uh, life was pretty good again. Things are going pretty good. This was uh, a, a moment that I, again, will cherish for the rest of my life because it changed the concept and the perception of Indian food in Sydney, at least. And I can say it with authority because there was not one cooking school in Sydney that was doing hands-on cooking classes. So we had, we had, uh, uh, we started off with probably one class every fortnight to approximately, uh, uh, which was about 25 classes a year, turned into nearly 75 classes every year from 2003 till about 2015, we did between 75 and 100 classes every year, which means I approximately did two classes every week. We did classes for parents and child. We did uh, kids in the kitchen. We did uh, classes for students from uh, across uh, schools in that area. Uh, where during their the holidays, uh, schools would approach me and say, would you enjoy be happy to do a little demonstration or even a hands-on class? As long as the kids were in a certain age group, I was happy to do it. So I did these classes and it was incredibly um, uh, rewarding for me personally as a chef because I was not only not only cooking, but I was also passing on this little uh, knowledge and experience that I gained in the industry to these young fellows, uh, the next generation. And mind you, uh, with uh, due respect to everyone and no offense to anybody, uh, these were white kids. These were kids of, uh, they were not of Indian origin. Yes, there were some kids of uh, Indian parentage, but the majority was all white. And I was so happy because suddenly Indian cuisine, which for about uh, 15 years for me or 20 years for me uh, in Australia was nothing but a curry in a hurry, had now become Indian food from different parts of India. And, and uh, you know, you kind of, you kind of uh, probably understand or uh, think about the amount of happiness, the 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 enormous uh, the enormity of this whole thing because. We were, Mira and I would look at each other and say, yes, we have finally done it. And then come 2000, and I, I think it was 2006 or seven, we had decided to take some time off. And just before that MasterChef Australia was to start and they decided to have their opening night in my restaurant. And uh, uh, for some reason, I could not be a part of it then, but later on, of course I did. But on that particular night, I still remember Mira said to me, Joy, uh, you know that little piece of paper that you wrote in Mumbai when you left for Australia, uh, the night before you left for Australia, you know where it is? I said, no, but maybe I gave it to you. I don't know. She said, yes, you gave it to me and here it is. And she opened up the page and it was in that page, I had written exactly what we were doing there. To do a restaurant with theme rooms, with Jal, Agni, Bhumi, Vayu, Akash, a Tiffin room downstairs, maybe even have a cooking studio. And believe it or not, I was living my dream. I was, uh, again, uh, to, to use a phrase which uh, most Australians are happy to use, I was the luckiest person on, uh, on the planet. You know, and I was living my dream. And uh, we said, uh, you know, we finally done it. So, but then, you know, you can't, you can't sit back and, and you know, take stock and say, this is it, but it, it's time to move on. It's time to do something else. What next was the next question? And uh, again, to my absolute amazement and surprise, the next trigger moment came in when uh, there was a company that was looking to do packaged Indian food. And it was one of the big companies that said, you know, we are looking for someone who can actually uh, do food trials and runs for us so that we can actually work on this and package Indian food and sell it to the supermarkets. Now, you won't believe this, but we took that as a trigger point and decided, why do it for them? We can then we can do it for ourselves. So around 2006 and seven, mind you, we were already doing some packaged food, but it was not with technology. So now 
sometimes the best part, we decided that, uh, you know, let's invest into some uh, equipment which uh, can actually blast chill and shock freeze Indian food, something that again had never been done before. So Mira and I, you know, get into this uh, uh, searching frame of mind to to find out where exactly can, uh, you know, we get equipment and how are we going to source it? How are we going to finance it? And uh, the only thing I said to me is once you know that you want to do it, there's always a way out or there's a way in. Uh, so we found out there was an Italian company that was just coming into Australia with some beautiful equipment to be used in food technology for processing food and shock freezing and so on and so forth. So we decided then to invest in this and we bought this equipment, started off with a, on a small scale. And in a matter of a year and a half or two, we were supplying to about 35 delis around Sydney, including one of the biggest deli in the Southern Hemisphere. And that was part of what they call them the David Jones food chain. Uh, again, folks, you know, these are little trigger moments, but uh, from the past, it was now getting into the present. And uh, come 2010, 11, life was pretty good settling down. Uh, it looked pretty good that, uh, you know, I had the whole package going. Uh, the cooking school was running well. The, the, the food uh, package industry was, uh, that was doing well. The restaurants going great. The menus were changing constantly. And, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of media interest. And uh, suddenly I get another call. And this was uh, from the gentleman. I'm not sure if you remember this. Uh, I spoke about the gentleman who was sitting right next to me and who was the uh, president of the Sheraton Group, which is called the ITT, then gives me a call and says, a Joy, uh, I'm still involved with the Sheraton, though I'm based in uh, Dubai now. And I was hoping that you could come and help us out as a, as a consultant. So, folks, you know, Life is interesting. Life is amazing. The more you risk it, the more you get into it. And uh, I found myself getting deeper and deeper into this. And, uh, you know, I said to Mira, what next? She said, well, you know, if the going is good, take it. Because uh, you don't want to regret on the last day that I had this opportunity and I did not take it. So why don't you, you know, take this opportunity, go to Dubai and see what you can do there. Uh, you can make a contribution. So for the next three months, I was a consultant with the Sheraton Group, and Mira and I would join me. Mira and I, my son would join me. Uh, so, folks, uh, this is a journey that has gone from uh, a little dream, which started off with a lot of disappointments, heartaches, uh, was now taking shape, and we were on a path. We were on a on a on a on the journey that was taking us to our destination. So, folks. Uh, Dubai did not last very long, mind you, because I could not make a commitment over a long period, over a long term. Uh, also, because I had a young family, my son was growing up, he was looking after him at home, and I had to look after the restaurant, and we were trying to, you know, balance this uh, work home life, and it's not, not always easy. But then you have to take some decisions, and one of them was to actually not pursue with the Dubai project anymore. So I came back and uh, decided that I need to focus on getting my business. Uh, you know, ready in a manner where it could look after itself. Uh, so, folks, uh, we had uh, uh, these uh, cooking classes uh, that were now within the restaurant. I was giving, you know, getting calls to do them across uh, Melbourne and uh, Perth and even Brisbane. So, I decided to start traveling around, taking my little vision to different parts of uh, Australia. And then uh, around 2013 or so, uh, the landlord, who, of course, he was a Japanese uh, who was living in Japan. His son-in-law was living right next to us. He came to me and he said, Joy, uh, Mr. Uh, Isamu Tabata, who was the owner of that place, is, uh, he's had a heart attack uh, and uh, he's probably not going to be uh, living for long. So Mr. Tabata has actually given me the responsibility of looking after his properties in Australia. He had a massive Kobe farm outside of Brisbane. He also had some food packaging business somewhere in uh, Adelaide. And he had a lot of properties, uh, including the one we were in. And he said, uh, I was, I'm was i now uh, taking charge of the company affairs on a day-to-day -day basis. So you, you, I will be the man you will be dealing with and not my father-in-law. So Nina and I, you know, for a moment we thought, is this the end of the uh, the golden dream is this going to be the end of the vision 
And, uh, you know, sometimes it's always good to cut your losses and, and run away or, you know, uh, not run away as an uh, uh, escape, but, but it's important to understand that you've lived that life. You have done, uh, you know, what you came here to do. You've, you've lived, you're living your dream, but it's also good to know that the dreams do come to an end. So come 2014, we started looking for a smaller place and thought, you know, been there, done that, now it's time to downsize. So 2014, 15 is a time when, you know, I, um, Mira and I are looking around and we are not very sure what exactly did we have in mind. And believe you, Mia, you know, a, a, a little, uh, you know, a little surprise package lands and I get a call from a guy who says to me, he says, Chef, my, my name is so-and-so and I worked with you about 15 years ago in Sydney and uh, you were very kind to me and you trained me and so on and so forth. And I run a little restaurant in Neutral Bay, which I'm finding it hard to run, but would it be okay for you to, to take over? And I don't want anything for it. I don't want any money, uh, but just take over the lease. And if you can, please, you know, help me out because I really am I'm going nowhere. So we take a look at this restaurant and it's the right size for us because we had this little concept in mind where we wanted to do something called the chef's tables. Um, however, slightly different in, in terms of the definition of chef's table because uh, if you came into the restaurant, you would actually be sitting in the kitchen. So the concept was that we do, it's an open, open kitchen, of course, as always, but you actually face the kitchen, you not, don't face each other. And we could seat about uh, between 20 and 25 people. So we, Mira and I again, think about this and say, maybe, you know, there's always another opportunity, you know, one door closes, another two doors open. And this is probably the first one that's open. So 2014, we take over this place and we call it Telecheri or Thalaseri. And again, the concept is that we will do food from that region, Telecheri region. So. Uh, regions of uh, North Kerala, Malabar Muslim style or Maple style food, the Syrian Christian food, do something from the Nambudri, Nambudri Pal style of cooking, you know. I uh, love those areas because there's so much of food, so much of cuisine, so much culture. And uh, again, to our absolute surprise and, uh, you know, happiness that start day one and we get people coming in, uh, they are looking for Indian food with a difference. And in that part where Telichiri started, there were restaurants of Indian origin, most of them selling what I call curry in a hurry. Now mind you, there's nothing against that, but it's just not my kind of food. And it's not what I've, uh, you know, I've, I've dreamed, of, I've dreamt of doing, but, you know, people have different versions of Indian food. And as my journey told me, as, uh, as, as it told me and I, Indian food comes from different parts of the world. There are different definitions of it. Uh, some of them that are connected to the, the to the motherland, as in India, don't call it curry. But those that are not connected, call it curry, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that we will call it by its true name. So we decided to again do uh, typical ethnic telecherry style of food in that restaurant. And for the next two and a half, three, four years, it was it it was the place to be in. And mind you, 25 seater restaurant, we were doing about two seatings every night and operate uh, four nights uh, from Wednesday to Saturday, close Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And uh, believe me again, a uh, lot of buzz, a lot of energy in that place. And that's the whole idea of running a restaurant, that there has to be a lot of positive energy. And we found that people were coming in, appreciating and giving us feedback. So what next is the question. And at the back of our mind, we knew that the, the the bigger place, the, the the mothership, which is in in Saint Leonard's, which was our dream, is now going to come to an end. So what happens next? And we thought about it, and the first thing that came to my mind was to check with my son if he would actually be a part of this journey. And uh, very politely, my son, who was then in his I think year twelve or eleven, said to me, "Dad, I love food. I love your cooking, and so on and so forth." Dad, don't get me wrong, but I don't want to do this which is perfectly fine because, you know, unless you, you really enjoy it, you know, it, it can't develop into a passion. Your passion doesn't happen overnight. Passion can be thrust upon somebody. 
uh, it, it has to develop. And uh, unless there's an there's inherent interest in in the cooking, in the, in the in in what we were doing, there was no point in asking him to join. And he was very keen on what he wanted to do. And we said, okay, it's about time. Then probably it's come at the right time. This whole thing. And uh, we decided that it's time to close shop over here and move to a smaller location. So we moved to a new place, and the new place was uh, pretty close to uh, Telicheri, but uh, different style of Indian food. So we decided to move about a less than half a kilometer from where Telicheri is or was, because now Telicheri is close for the time being because of uh, all the problems we are having. And uh, we decided to close it and have only one restaurant called Nilgiri's running for us. So we moved to the new location in a place called Trimon. Now, mind you, Primon is uh, is a highly affluent area where people have people sit on massive properties, and uh, most of them have uh, kids who are in their late thirties and forties, so they have no mortgage, they have plenty of dispensable income, and uh, you know they want they want to go out pretty much every night, and they want to be seen, they want to be in in places where you know there are it's it's a who's and who kind of an area. Uh, this was not the reason why we actually wanted to go there, but we found the best spot, and mind you. Uh, it just suited my style of cooking. So we decided that uh, it's time to get in um, with, a, with a fresh set of eyes, do something different. So uh, I think it must have been probably March, April 2015 that we signed the lease for this premises. And we got a lease for about 25 years. Hopefully I'm still there in the 25th year uh, to do what I'm still doing. But we got in here and the, the plan was again to do something different. So we decided over here, it will probably be my style of Indian food. Uh, but again, when I say my style, it will still be true to its origin. I mean, it's still, uh, if it's Hyderabadi, it will taste Hyderabadi food does. But instead of giving it in a, in a manner which we were doing it in the old place, it will have a little more oomph to it. It will have a little more uh, character to it. It will be clean plates. and. Uh, try and do more of a degustation or uh, tasting menus where uh, the presentation is important, but to me, presentation would be on the top of the list without compromising on the quality. So we started Dengiris in uh, in Cremon, and we are in our fifth year, and uh, hoping that it goes on for some time. Uh, come 2019, I again, this is another trigger moment for me. Uh, mind you, I've been drinking wine for about 30 odd years and uh, uh, love wine, though I don't really appreciate spirits and beers anymore, but I do love my wine and I, uh, I try and have at least a glass or two, maybe three at night after work, of course. But in 2018-19, I met this man, uh, again, uh, surprisingly of, uh, of an Indian origin, and he, had, he lives in Australia. He's been here for about uh, 40 years or so. And uh, we became good friends over the, over the next couple of uh, months and a year or so. And uh, this man, to my absolute amazement, is deep into wines and not just drinking wines, but uh, having an understanding of how wines are made and uh, the difference between old world wines and new world wines. And we started tasting wines and he got me hooked to this, this thing about tasting wines. And he said, Joy, once you get into the world of wines, all roads lead to Burgundy. I said, you'll be surprised, Ajay, if I don't see you in the next six to eight months doing a course in wines. And folks, this to me was uh, the beginning of a new journey. So I was uh, uh, very keen on understanding and learning about wines uh, and started this course uh, at the WSCT. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think it seems there is uh, I think I'm probably out of time. I don't know. Uh, I can't, I'm not sure if you can hear me still. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can you still hear me? Usha, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. But uh, another part, we have got five Sorry, minutes. what is that? Sorry, five, five minutes, minutes, is it? Yes, five minutes for then we start with a Q&A session. Sorry sure, sure, interrupt. okay. Right, so yeah. Uh, well, so where to next? As I said, past, present, and future. Well, I think I've got one small innings left in me to play, and uh, this innings that I think I can play would be 
pairing Indian food with wines, and that's a challenge. Uh, in the past, everyone said, you know, wines and Indian food don't go together. Indian food and beer go together, spices and beers go together, but not really wines. And uh, again, mind you, this is what, I, what I've learned over the past six to eight months that I've started understanding and studying wines that if you understand the chemistry of wines, then you probably understand why it should or should not complement Indian food. And what I do know now is that uh, wines with less tannins or very little tannins or no tannins can go very well with Indian food. Having said that, there's also school of thought that says you can actually complement Indian food with wines, or you can have a contrast with Indian wines, uh, with Indian food, which means uh, the wine can actually complement it or contrast it. So here, here I'm at a crossroad now trying to understand whether I should have plenty of heavy reds or light reds or do Beaujolais or Burgundies or do the Malbecs or do, you know, whites like the Rieslings and, uh, you know, Sav Blancs or the Aligote and so on and so forth. So folks, um, yeah, it's been wonderful sharing my, uh, my thoughts with you and hope uh, if I can encourage or if I can if I could uh, you know, inspire one person out of this whole group to become a true Indian chef, true to his roots. I know most of us do want to become chefs uh, and work for the French uh, restaurants and the Germans and the Italians, nothing wrong with it. But I do feel that there is someone out there who can take uh, you know, Indian food to the next level up, take pride in what we are doing because Indian food is so vast and we really want to take our food to a point where it is recognized as a cuisine, not just a damn curry in a hurry. So thank you very much, folks, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Usha. Oh, thank you, one minute. Uh, thank you, Chef Rajan, for a scintillating session. I, I'm certain, <laughs> I'm certain uh, that your achievements will motivate many in this forum. And uh, participants, kindly I request to key in your queries so that we can start. Yes. The first question uh, from uh, Chef Sushil to Arakana. Where do you see the trend of Indian food going next? Instead of taking it forward, we need to actually take it backwards, isn't it? Your thoughts on it? Yeah, absolutely right, Usha. And uh, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, Chef, uh, my, my point is this, that before we take a step forward, we need to look back and see what is it that, you know, our food has offered to the world, to us. And the moment we look back, we find that there is a massive warehouse of knowledge uh, culinary knowledge. There's so much of information there that we have not tapped into. And one of the things that I do tell students here who want to learn Indian food is that we all have heard of uh, Larousse gastronomic. We have heard of herrings. Uh, very few people have heard of uh, Professor Katie Achaya's book on Indian food, the, the history of Indian food. Maybe some of you have got it. I, I consider that to be the Bible of uh, Indian food. But along with that, if you can get a copy of uh, Dr. Uh, J. S. Puthi's book on spices. Now, this man is an absolute genius. He's not alive anymore, but he wrote this book about 30 odd years ago or 40 years ago. And the amount of information that you can get on spices is incredible. So, club these two, and you look back and you have so much of information and knowledge. What we as chefs can do is before we look forward, gather this information, collate it turn it into something that inspires us. Maybe it could be cuisine of Hyderabad, cuisine of, uh, you know, food of Chetina uh, uh, cuisine, or, um, you know, food from Marat Marathwada, or Gujarati food, or Parsi food. Put a little bit of ourselves into it and showcase this cuisine to the world. Believe you me, the world is waiting for us. The world really wants to see an, one Indian chef who can take this food to the next level up. I know there are a few who are doing it in London, there are a few doing it in Sydney and Australia. Uh, some of them are doing it in America, but the numbers are far little to be even spoken about. We need to join together as a force and say, Indian food needs to go up a few notches. And, uh, and, and Chef Sushil, uh, 
Indian food is on its cusp now. It is waiting to just explode. However, we need young people because there's nothing like having a young chef in the kitchen who can take this forward. So, hope I've answered my question. Uh, uh, could you please repeat the name of the book, Chef Social Bonds to Know? Yes, the book is called uh, Dr. J S P R U T H I. Dr. J S Pruthi is the author of the book. A scientist who worked for the CSIR in India, especially in the spice area and the spice department, he has written this book. It is an amazing copy, and and an encyclopedia of information on spices. Mind you, you will get information on spices everywhere and anywhere, but the amount of technical knowledge this man has put into the book is amazing. You know, he talks about the uh, the little things about turmeric, uh, what, what is the difference between uh, turmeric from the west and turmeric from the east, and you know, you have uh, uh, the, the curcurum and the little, uh, you know, uh, differences in the coloring agents and all that may not be relevant, may not be important, but it helps. Any information that you have is important to me. That's what I think. So if you can get a copy of that, please, please do get hold of it. Dr. J. S. Pruthi is the gentleman. And if you can get that copy, nothing like it, folks. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Dr. G. S. Saravana Kumar. Chef, is any wine pairing done officially for our ethnic Indian food? Um, as I said, no, but uh, I'd be happy to do it if someone wants to to take the first step um, and and sponsor wines because the wines that I'm looking for are low tannin wines, wines that have high acidity, very little fruit in it, no residual sugar because reasonings for a long time were considered to be sweet wines. No, we don't need a sweet wine. Sweet wine and Indian food don't go together. At the same time. Too much of floral influence on the wine is also not good because Indian food has to showcase itself. It needs to stand out. You need a wine that blends in, and I think a good dry Riesling, um, both from Alsace and from Rheingau in uh, in Germany, or from uh, even uh, uh, even uh, Moselle. Moselle uh, Riesling is fantastic. You could even try something called the Aligote. Chardonnays from cooler climates are fantastic. Uh, Light reds like a like a Beaujolais or a Gamay, uh, excellent Pinot Noirs which are young can go well. Not the aged one, of course, because then they start to have tertiary qualities in them. The wood comes in, the cedar comes in, the smoke comes in. You don't want those qualities. You want the wine to be pure so that it blends in with the spicy food that we we are talking about. Um, and again, uh, uh, wines that are extremely heavy may not be good enough, but there are some Malbecs. Again, Malbec from Kehor in France may not be the right one, but getting Malbec from Argentina, uh, again, from the upper echelons, the, the uh, cooler climate ones, fantastic. Uh, Malbec like the Alamos. Uh, to answer your question, doctor, again, uh, another six months, probably I will give another nine months and I will be doing what I call uh, a pairing of Indian food and wines as a regular feature in my restaurant probably on Thursday nights. And we would call them chef's tables or we can even, we, we may, may even call them kitchen tables. Let's see. But the plan is to uh, to to bend them together and of course charge a price because uh, all good things cost money. I mean, if you're looking at a good product, you need to pay the price. Thank you, Chef. The next question comes from Manas Sarkar. How will how will you introduce the lost and forgotten recipes of Indian cuisine in India and worldwide and how to make them popular? Okay, uh, I, I, I have to start with something called the cuisine of the Parsis. Okay, they, uh, I'm pretty sure we all know Parsis, but uh, Parsis had documented their food a long, long time ago. And there's one book and only one book called Vivid Vani that exists and that uh, probably two copies, one of which is in, in England and the other copy is with this good friend of ours who lives in Sydney. And Vivid Vani talks about Parsi food that's about 300, 400, 500 years old. So how do we do this with Indian food? 
that unfortunately we have not documented recipes, but then it's never too late to start. Maybe somebody can start, maybe somebody can research and find out recipes that have long, long forgotten and lost. A lady by the name of Joyce Westrip, I'm not sure if anyone has heard of Joyce Westrip, but she was born in India of English parentage, migrated to Australia in around 1951 or 52 and wrote two fantastic books. And Joyce Westrip, to me, is the living legend of Indian food. People like Joyce Westrip could be contacted because she is sitting on a, 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 a plethora of recipes that she has got from India. And mind you, because her family was in India for about six or seven generations of British uh, people, um, she has got all this information. Um, I'm pretty sure you can actually dig out all this uh, through archives. But how do we take it forward? How do we do this is a challenge. It, it, the answer is not very simple. Unless all chefs come together, and when I say all, as in like-minded chefs come together and say, we need to work towards taking our, our food to the next level up. It's like the Italians, they have chefs join together and, and talk about what they need to do. They are, they are competitive, but they also work together to take their cuisine. It's not my restaurant, it's our cuisine that they're talking about. Yeah, a, a similar thing needs to happen with Indian chefs. We need to join together and say, yes, this is Andhra food, this is Telangana food, or this is Hyderabadi food, but at the end of the day, it is Indian food. We need to come together and take this forward. So a bit of mateship will help. Yeah, thank you, Chef. I, I think there are many more. We will just run through very quickly Please. all the questions. Uh, a question from K.S. Narayan. Indian food, though vast and according to me, is the best cuisine in the world, is now being served as fusion with individuality being lost. How do we bring back on track to be a solitary winner? Uh, thanks, uh, K.S., uh, for the question. I, I'm a great believer that Fusion to me is confusion. You know, uh, it does justice to neither uh, the original cuisine nor the the one that you are creating. So to me, it's it, it's best that we stick to the to the roots. Um, in a in a in a humble way, my my advice to the people doing fusion would be to leave it behind because uh, you know this is not going to last. Uh, fusion cuisine is going to going to become a mess. Uh, it's best that we do Hyderabadi food or we do Chinese food, but not club the two together and say Hyderabadi Chinese. It really doesn't exist. How are we going to take it forward? I don't know, but to me, the change starts from me. As long as I say that it is either Hyderabadi or Chinese, and, and I need to be serious about it. I need to be sure about it. And if I can do that, I think I would have taken a massive step forward. So again, uh, that's my take on it. Thank you. Uh, Thank the next you. one comes from Dr. Pankaj Kumar Singh. Why small chefs are not respectable? Uh, sorry, I missed you there again. Why small chefs are not respectable? Small as in, in stature or as in position? Position, I, I think so. Okay. Um, this is a tricky one. I don't know if in today's world, if there's such a thing as nobody has a respect, I think we need to respect each other. And that's the core philosophy when you work as a team that uh, in a chain, every member is important. And in my restaurant, the, the most important person in my kitchen, and I have a small team today, uh, whether it was small or big in the past, the most important person was the man who was right at the bottom of the food chain. And he was called the, the, the dishwasher, the kitchen ad. And the reason for that is, he did the best and the probably the most difficult job. Firstly, he, his job was to peel and cut and slice onions and so on and so forth. He also played the part of washing dishes at night in the machine, of course. If he did not turn up, there was a complete collapse of the, in the system. So uh, what do we do? We must respect that man. And if there is a problem with respect, I think it needs to be taken care of, right? At, at the bottom level, at the, at the ground root level, the grassroots level. So I don't know. I don't know and I don't uh, understand and I don't appreciate when people don't have respect. Um, to me, this is not the done thing today anymore. So, you know, respect is, is 
first give, then you can take it. Yeah. Doesn't thank matter you. What position. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's a, another uh, other question about uh, please repeat the name of the book by K.S. Naran. I think uh, he has repeated. And the next one is from uh, Ms. Vasundra Dharmaraj. Chef, what are your thoughts on ingredient based menus? Ah, this is a tough one again, though it is something that is in vogue. It's happening. Uh, I'm not very sure it can work with Indian food. However, we tried something in the past where we decided we could do dishes with five ingredients. Really, Indian food cannot survive on five or six ingredients. You know, Indian food is a combination of um, all the all the little nuances need to come together to make music. And exactly the same, all the seven, eight spices need to come together to create that music, that, that dish, or the, you know, that, that beautiful presentation on a plate. Uh, if we were to do, you know, spice-based dishes or uh, herb-based dishes, the numbers will have to be limited. And I don't think that will work with Indian food. However, it might work with other cuisines because the emphasis is not on on spices or the, or the herbs as much as it is on the protein. Uh, you know, French cuisine is protein based. Chinese cuisine is protein based. Indian food is herb and spice based. And we really need to put all these spices together, whether it is in minute quantities or major quantities. They need to come together as a team. Um, to say, yes, uh, we can do, you know, spice and herb or ingredient based dishes will be a little challenge. But if someone's doing it, good luck to him. I'd be more than happy to check it out. But to me, it's a it's a little difficult. Thank you, possible? thank you, sir. Yes, yeah. thank you. The next question is from Dr. Jitendra Das, IHM Chennai. Uh, chef, do you think Indian food is still an Indian food or Indian cuisine? We have to really rush. We have another three minutes sure. to answer. I do few understand. More uh, yeah. To to answer your question, we are not up there yet. Uh, but it would help if someone like you joins us <laughs> and, and helps us take it to the next level. We do want young people to come and join us. We don't want people who have been there, done that. Yes, they will always be there as a guiding force, but the, the next generation needs to take it up and say, yes, I can do it. You know, just as they want to do it with other cuisines, they need to do it. You look at the Japanese cuisine. There are masters sitting up there, but they have apprentices who are as young as 16, 17, 18, who spend their entire life doing sushi. And then they become masters. Indian food needs something like that. You need a guiding force, and then you need the younger generation to to join forces and to take this cuisine, uh, this food, to the next level up and be recognized as a cuisine. Uh, I hope in my lifetime it happens. Let's see. Inshallah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, thank the, you. the next question from Professor Zakaria Joseph. Chef, what is your take on the Indian street food, like chaats, bada pav, and other simple food, making it to the global scene? Oh, fantastic. Great idea. Uh, I think it's about time we do it. The Malaysians have done it extremely well. The Singaporeans have done it well. The Chinese have done it well. The Koreans have done it well. Uh, the French tried the pancakes, didn't work uh, well. Uh, I don't know about any other cuisine. The Japanese are doing it, but not exactly on streets. They're doing it in small restaurants and they've got mission stars. Uh, so the, again, Indian food should and can be taken to the next level up. And the only thing I would say is straight, stay true to the roots. Uh, if you are doing Mirchi Bhajis from Hyderabad, make sure you taste it a hundred times or 300 times because the Mirchi Hyderabadi Pakoda, that, that Mirchi Pakoda from Hyderabad has a distinct taste, which you will never get anywhere else. So try and recreate that is going to be a challenge. So calling it Mirchi Bhaji from Hyderabad is not going to make it Mirchi Bhaji unless it takes you back in memory to that place, you know, to that area in, in wherever it is, because you have Mirchi Ke Pakode from Hyderabad, you know it is from Hyderabad. That's how clear it is. And when you have Tali Hui Machi from, you know, Lajpat Nagar market, one bite into it and you know it. Is. So Staying true to the roots is going to be the challenge. Calling it Vada Pao, Vada Bhai, this thing, you know, Bhel Puri and all that is good, but can you actually connect to the roots? Can you be true to it and say, this takes me to Pune or this Purnachi poet takes me to some place in Gujarat or Maharashtra? Then do it, but don't 
no point just calling it street food and leaving it there to hang and dry on its own. Um, it, it is fascinating, you know, that 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 egg dosa that you get in certain parts of uh, Pondicherry and Chennai, that taste cannot be recreated unless you spend time with that guy who does it for some time. But it's a great yeah. concept. Oh, thank you, thank you. And uh, I would be just taking one more question uh, from, um, I think about the COVID, somebody had asked the relevant one, others, please, sorry. Uh, running short of time, I will take one last question from Oh, this is uh, from KS Narayan again. COVID pandemic has brought back the memories of mom made food. Simple yet tasty, easy to make. Homemade kitchen catering to a lot of residents has become prominent. Does this mean the home food, a homemade ingredient based food could be one of the norm for future of an Indi of Indian cuisine? Why not? Um, I'm pretty sure that can be, and there's a lady in Sydney who's doing it. Uh, she calls it uh, Enter Via Laundry, is the name of the restaurant. Because you are actually entering her house through from the laundry. And she does these uh, little one night stands, she calls it, when she uh, does food from the Gujarati household or Maharashtrian household. And, and she does a pretty good job, and she's got fantastic reviews. The question here is, can this be translated into a serious business? Can it become a business model that can then be translated over uh, on a global scale? Doing home style cooking in home will work. Will it work in a restaurant atmosphere? I don't know. I, I, again, uh, as, a, as a professional commercial chef, and I'm a commercial chef, uh, there has to be a, a shift in the mind. You know, That's probably going to be a big challenge uh, for us to move from fully eaten or dine in restaurant when COVID hit us uh, to uh, delivery and uh, you know, takeaway took us a long time. And, and today we are comfortable. So maybe it's a, it's a mind shift that, that really needs to take place. And if that happens, maybe home cooked food, which uh, as, Dr., as, as uh, Vasundra said, uh, with five ingredients or limited ingredients or uh, ingredient based cuisine, as we call it, can become popular. But on a commercial level, it's going to be a bit of a challenge. Thank you. Thanks a lot for being there amidst your uh, busy schedule. And uh, I would like to request the participants who were not, uh, whose questions were not taken to key, uh, to just uh, to mail or, or to contact Chef Ajoy. And he has got a few books on Indian cuisine to his credits. And uh, it will be great if you could connect with him. Thanks a lot, Chef, for Thank being you. there. Thanks Thank a you lot. very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.